Auckland turned on cold weather and occasional showers when the Gambia returned from Japan recently. However, it didn't dampen the enthusiasm of relatives and friends who came down to give her a record welcome. Before returning to New Zealand, these men had eight months continuous service with the British Pacific Fleet and were also able to see something of Japan after its collapse. They admit it was interesting, but after all, what could compare with this? After a long voyage from Ceylon, the aircraft carrier HMS Empress calls at Wellington to disembark 370 New Zealand naval officers and men who had previously served with the East Indies fleet. These New Zealanders played a vital role in the war against Japan. They kept open the sea lanes to India. They brought never-ending supplies of men and material for the fighting fronts of Burma and Indochina. They helped to make victory possible. Now they're home, and most of them are returning to civilian life. In this children's ward at the Wellington Hospital, it's something more than visitor's day. Here's a magician to provide a dose of entertainment. The children are ready for anything. Regular entertainment is a feature of their stay in this ward thanks to the efforts of those who give their time and talent to brightening the long hours of children cut off from all the fun of life. The magician has an audience who really appreciates all his tricks. He is one of the many who provide entertainment that helps towards a quicker recovery. No one wants to go to sleep just now. Aches and pains are forgotten. A real live rabbit to play with. This might be just a child's dream come true. There are no shops as yet in the Warrington area of the Nainai housing estate, but on this corner site a department store is to be built, and it will belong to the state tenants themselves. Those who've bought shares in the co-op shop to be are contributing labor as well as money to this community enterprise. It is the local residents who are clearing the site for their shopping centre. The chairman of the Voluntary Works Committee is a returned man of the engineers. Organisational work by many residents has gone into this scheme. Another returned engineer in the working bee is the Honourable Major Skinner, in civil life, Minister of Rehabilitation. He has a special interest in this project because the skilled building work is to be done by rehabilitation trainees. In the afternoon, everyone comes out to see the official opening of their co-op scheme, which is the first collective effort of this newly formed community. The chairman of the Provisional Cooperative Council announces that over 1,100 pounds worth of shares have already been taken up in the houses round about. It's very unwise to mention such a large sum of money, jokes the district's MP, Mr. H. Coombs. The Minister of Finance is present and he might be listening. For the opposition, Mr. Holland wished the movement every success. He was glad to see for himself how people could cooperate for their own good. Shops were urgently needed here, said Mr. Nash, the next speaker, and he would ask for building priorities for them. The community spirit of Nainai was attributed by Major Skinner to the fact that half the inhabitants were returned servicemen and their families. Much sound advice came from a man from Lancashire, the home of the cooperative movement, the Honourable Ben Roberts, Minister of Agriculture. Finally, the Prime Minister spoke of the success of cooperation in his native Scotland. If residents did their part in community schemes like this, said Mr Fraser, they could be sure of every help from the government. With the meeting over, residents start signing up to do voluntary labour next weekend. Down to the shores of a Rotorua lake drive men from the trout hatcheries. It's spawning time for the trout and the men have come to collect the trout over. <music> to 
To catch the trout, they go down to a small stream that flows into the lake. Here the big ones lurk, the ones that got away, the ones that grow bigger every day, in bars, by firesides, and wherever men get together. With wire netting stretched from bank to bank, they move upstream, driving the trout before them. Strangely puzzled, the fish mill around. They've resisted the purple March Browns, the Twilight Beauties, the Silver Doctors, and all the other lures known to cunning anglers. But this is something they cannot escape. Neatly netted, the fish are tipped into a box where they're stripped and then released. And if you're cunning enough to fatten yourself on the bottom, you can dodge the net. All this activity and commotion is necessary to keep lakes and rivers well stocked with sporting fish. If the trout spawned in the streams, few eggs would survive until hatching, and before long anglers would be casting their flies on fishless waters. And back at the hatcheries, the eggs receive every care while hatching. First signs of life inside the egg are the eyes, which show as black spots. And this is what the young fry look like when they're first hatched. The yolk sacs remain attached until they can feed by mouth. Now they're as long as your little finger and ready for release in fishing streams. They're taken there in special cans, but before they're let go, a check is made to see that the water is the right temperature. And so the little fries start life in the big stream. If they avoid being eaten by eels, swept out to sea in a flood, poisoned by pollution, or hooked by anglers, they'll grow up into nice big fish like these.